Welcome to Calvary. My name is Rebecca and I serve in children's ministry. Here at Calvary, we want this to be a place where you can come and worship, get to know God, and connect with our community. If you're new here, we can't wait to get to know you. Feel free to message us on social media or text the word hello to 587-323-1199 and we'll respond right back. It's a great first step to joining our church family, but it's also about daily personal encounters with God, discipleship, and community. If you want to learn more about our culture here, deepen your relationship with God, and find a small group that you can really connect with, we'd encourage you to talk with one of our volunteers or staff after the service. If you think back to your home growing up, what were some of the principles? What were some of the rules that your family lived by? You know, one of the principles uh, that was important to Lorianne that we were trying to teach our kids was selflessness. And so as a rule that governed our home, it was that our kids are not the center of our family. They are a welcome member of the family, but the world does not revolve around them. The most important relationship in the home was between Lorianne and I, between mom and dad, for that was the strength and the stability of a family. If the enemy can get, can, it can break the unity between mom and dad, he goes a long way in creating destruction and a lot of pain in the kids. Now, I know that not all of us are in the situation where there is a mother and father in the home. If that is you and your situation, that is not to discourage you, it's just simply to point out that about how God has set the family up to work best. Each child for us in our home, and we had five of them, each child was loved and valued for who they are. And their needs and their desires, they are important. But the demands of the child would not trump the health of our marriage relationship or what the rest of the family was doing. This was one of the rules that guided our home. Another principle that we sought to teach them was respect. And so we established this rule that if mom or dad were talking to someone else, they couldn't come up and rudely or sometimes obnoxiously interrupt. But they would put their hand either on our hip or upon our shoulder, whatever they could reach, and then when we were in our conversation, we would pet our hand on their hand to let them know that, to acknowledge their presence. And then when there was a break in the conversation, then we would turn to them and find out what their need was. This taught them to respect others and not just to make themselves the center of attention. Remember, teaching them that life does not revolve around them. What are some of the rules that govern your home? You know, I know of a family who has three rules. No talking back, no interrupting, obey the first time. And they posted them on the fridge for years. And there are others who would say that they don't have rules. Well, I would say then that's a rule in itself. Now, whatever rules we set, they don't necessarily create the desirable behavior in our children. Does this mean that having rules is pointless? Well, no, because rules reveal what's important to the parents. They set clear expectations for our kids, and they provide boundaries for appropriate behavior and interaction with others. But at the end of the day, we realize that rules don't create the obedience that they command. Rules are like that. They guide behavior, but they don't create it. Just ask a police officer or check with Corrections Canada. As of a couple of years ago, there were some 40,000 people in prison or on parole in Canada. And yet we have more laws in Canada than that we've ever had in any point of our history. God has rules. Rules that guide us in how to relate to him 
rules that set boundaries not only for our interaction with each other in society, but also house rules for the church of God, for the family of God. Some of these rules are called the Old Testament law. God gave them through Moses as a requirement for gaining the inheritance that God promised Abraham. And the Jewish people sought to follow these laws religiously so that they could be included. And some people love this. Just give me the rules and I will follow them till the day I die. When Moses receives God's law on Mount Sinai, it says, uh, it, it laid out righteousness, rules for life, rules for right living, and for right relating to God. Though it calls for righteousness and holy living, it cannot create righteousness within us. This is a weakness of the law. It cannot create within us the desire to do the very thing that it demands of us. Rules can guide right desire, but it cannot give us right desire. They don't change our heart. Just because the posted speed limit is 80 doesn't mean I want to go 80. May not mean I'm, I'm going to go 80. But if the rules can't change our heart, then why have them in the first place? Like, what are they good for? If rules can't rescue us from this present evil age, then what can? Well, we are in a series in the book of Galatians, a letter written to a number of churches in a Roman province called Galatia in what is today the country of Turkey. The churches here are struggling with this concept of rules as it relates to God's rescue plan for both the Jews and also everybody else in the world. How do they access the promise that God gave to Abraham and the righteousness gained through it? Pastor Doug explored that last week. Well, Paul now gives them, and therefore us, an example for us to help us understand. So if you have your Bibles either a physical copy or perhaps on your device, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. In fact, for today, why don't we stand together out of reverence for the Word and the God who wrote this as we read this together. Follow along as I read it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And notice that the scriptures doesn't say to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child, and that, of course, means Christ. This is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now, a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promise? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made, with, with, made right with God by obeying it. But if the scriptures declare that, but the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. 
And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. May the Holy Spirit bless to our hearts the reading of his word. You may be seated. If you have your notes when you walked in this morning, if you pick them up, we'll be following along. You can pull them out. If you don't have a a paper copy and would like one, you can just raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring you one. They are also available off the Church Center app and you can follow along electronically. In fact, you can even take notes right there on that digital page. Let's pray once again. God, as I think, as we read about Abraham, I am reminded of the conflict in the Middle East. Two sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, and the conflict that happened between them. God, that conflict, we know, we can study the history, we know that is what continues even to today. But you are very clear in Scripture that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to pray for the peace of Israel. And so, in Jesus' name, we do that today. Thank you for the promise that you gave to Abraham. Thank you for this word that we, as we will study it here in these next few moments, for the peace that can come when we follow your word. Peace to our spirit, peace to our life and to our relationships, peace to our world. And so in Jesus' name, God, would would there be peace for Israel there in the Middle East? And we pray for all of those families who are torn apart by war, who are injured, all those individuals injured by war and violence. God, would you reveal the truth of Jesus to them? Would you bring healing to them? Not just their bodies, but also their spirit and their soul so that they would come to know you as their personal Savior. But we commit them, and I commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul, his example demonstrates to us Number one, that God's rescue plan is given as an irrevocable agreement. Verse 15, dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promises to Abraham. Verse 17, this is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. Here we are, almost 2,000 years later, and the concept of irrevocable agreements still stand today. For instance, in as much as I understand Canadian law, here's a couple quick illustrations. An irrevocable living trust can be set up with assets of property or money set aside for the benefit of a group of people or organizations. Once established, it cannot be changed either by the the grantor or the beneficiary. In real estate, An irrevocable power of attorney over a piece of property that a person owns can be signed over to someone else. Romans chapter 11 says that God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. God's rescue plan from the very beginning of human nature, of of human history, can be traced all the way back to Adam and Eve when they first disobeyed God. And his plan to save us from our sin, it was at that time that it came into motion. You see, God will never be defeated or distracted. What he plans, he accomplishes. What he starts, he finishes. What he orders, he pays for. He makes everything work according to his plan. He is God, and there is none like him. He declares the end from the beginning. Our 
irrevocable agreements are a cloudy but mirrored reflection of God and his character. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are unfaithful, he is faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Unlike many of us, when God makes a promise, he never fails to deliver. It may not be in our timing, It may not look the way we think it will look or the way we think it should look, but he will never fail. He's never late. Can you trust him? This promise to Abraham was given as a covenant. Now, covenants are not like contracts we have in business today. Contracts hold conditions on both parties. It's basically one long if-then statement. If one party fails to uphold one of their conditions, then the whole contract is nullified. Covenants in the Bible are different. They tend to be one-sided. They are a promise from one party to another. You can study the covenant that God made with Abraham In Genesis 15, it's one-sided. There was no condition placed on Abraham. You know, take the marriage vows, the marriage covenant. The vows that we make for richer, for poorer, uh, for, uh, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, they say nothing about a condition that is placed upon the other person. Now, I know that I know that this can be a sensitive issue for those, uh, for a number of circumstances. Generally, God's call for us to uphold our end of the covenant. That's the vow that we made when we stood there at our wedding. He, his call is to remain true to our covenant, our promise, our vow, our vow even when we feel our spouse is not fulfilling or living up to theirs. God's rescue plan is based on an uh, irrevocable agreement that he made, and he cannot, and therefore he will not, go back on his promise. And... We see this rescue plan developed throughout Old Testament law. 430 years after Abraham, God gives the law to Moses, but the rules actually logjam the flow of God's blessing to them. You can go read that for yourself in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, if perhaps today is your Sabbath, you take extra time. But if we follow the storyline of Scripture it's reasonable to think that the law that God gave Moses would direct the flow of God's promises <clears throat> excuse me, to the nations. If this would be true, then the law would be like a funnel to which, into which the God would pour his promises out to all of the nations. In other words, keeping the rules is the only way to please God and to be blessed by him. Now, This isn't true. But it is how Jews in the first century, like those stirring up trouble right here in Galatia, thought. It's the way they viewed things. So it makes sense that they would require Gentiles, who is anybody that is not a Jew, to become like a Jew in order to receive the blessings of Abraham. You want a blessing? You want his blessing? Trust in the rules. You want the blessing of Abraham? Become a child of Abraham by embracing the law and living like a Jew. Now, let me ask you, how do you tend to respond to rules? If I can throw us into two categories, one category is the rule keepers. This group is those of us living, is that living by the rules is the only way to make sense of life. What's most important is to follow the letter of the law. And if this is you, you know exactly who I'm talking about. The other group is the rule breakers. 
any rule tends to grate against this group. This group tends to believe that if there's a rule in place, someone's just trying to steal our fun. The thought is, as long as the consequences aren't too bad, it's worth breaking it just to find out. Which group are you in? Whether we seek to keep them or we seek to break them, how easy is it for us to get fixated on rules? The first group often think that we can gain life by obeying the rules. That somehow the rules are the source of life. The second group thinks they can gain life by breaking the rules. The Old Testament law's inability to give life is actually the thrust of Paul's teaching here in this book of Galatians. No matter how hard they tried to fulfill or obey the law, it was impossible. It cannot do the most important thing, which is to make us alive to God and experience the life that Jesus came to give. Simply obeying the rules will not gain us the ultimate prize. But then you might ask, how does God's promise and God's law relate to each other? Well, fundamentally, the law doesn't modify. It doesn't complicate the promise or the original terms of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. That's impossible because of the irrevocable agreement that we just read about in verse 15. God gave the law for a very specific purpose. Verse 19, why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. Think about that. God gave the law because of sin. Countries and provinces have laws because of sin. Cities have bylaws. Families make rules. Teachers post guidelines for behavior in classroom. Football has a rule book. Employers have policies, all because of sin. If citizens were always upstanding, there would be no reason there'd be no need for police officers in prisons. If hockey players were always gentle and polite, there'd be no need for penalty boxes. If employees never took advantage of the system, there would be no need for policy manuals. And if the people of God were perfectly sinless, there would be no need for the law of God. Is it possible that the reason these things exist is because God, it, they are God's last line of defense against unrestrained sin and the brokenness that's caused by it? You know, some people believe that stop signs and traffic lights only restrict freedom. But they actually give us freedom. Freedom to drive safely to our destination. In the same way, some view God's law on marriage and sex restrictive. But they actually keep us safe and enables us to enjoy the blessings of sex and intimacy without the bondage that comes from sex outside of marriage and the brokenness that comes along with that. We sold a couch this last week, and when I'm delivering it into uh, their living room, I'm I'm only in their home for a few moments, but as I interact with their preschool boys and observe their interaction as a family, I notice very quickly some of the rules of the household. There is order in the midst of preschool children chaos. And while there is freedom for these boys to be their rambunctious selves, there is respect and obedience in their interaction even in their interaction with me. And in this, I see a reflection of who the parents are and their value system. I appreciated being in their home. And as I'm leaving, I pray a blessing over them. 
You know, much like rules of the home reveal something about the parents, God's law reveals to God's children something about who God is, his character. His law not only reflects his holiness, it reflects his desire to curb sin and the destructive, um, its destruction in our life. But we're not going to know sin or even see our sin unless he points it out to us. His law does that. Like this verse says, it shows us our sin. But it also does something more. It helps us understand that we can't actually keep the rules. That it's impossible to please God and to be made right with God. As, we, as in justification and in righteousness that we've looked at over the last few weeks here. We can't do this in our own strength. It's simply not possible. Rule keeping will never cover the sin gap between us and God. We will never measure up to his holiness. Giving the law may seem cruel. But I'm not sure how else that we would understand. Rule keeping cannot change our heart. Rule breaking can't either, by the way. Though God's law outlines right living and the way to connect with God, it cannot give us the motivation for right living, nor the ability or the desire to be made right with God. That is demonstrated all through the Old Testament in Israel's relationship with him. Verse 21, is there conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If, and that's a big if, the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But it can't, so we won't. God's rescue plan to save us from this present evil age is achieved through Jesus Christ. Verse 16. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children as if it was meant, uh, as, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. Verse 19, it's not on PowerPoint, but it says, but the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. Now, notice that first phrase in verse 16 there. Maybe just leave it up for a minute. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. Not to the church or the family of God. Not even to you and me. It is to Abraham and his seed that is Christ. Abraham and Jesus are the only two recipients of God's promise. Abraham passes away, and so Christ is the only, is the one true beneficiary of all God's promises. God has given everything to him. Every blessing that God wants to give to the world for all of time and eternity, which includes you and me, he's already given to Jesus. And what does that mean? It means that every blessing that we seek, every good thing we are seeking from God's hand, both in this world and in the life to come, is found in Christ. It's only found in Christ. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 19 says, For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. As God's ultimate yes, he always does what he says. For all of God's promises, this is the key phrase, have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Christ is the center of all that God is doing in the world. In fact, Christ is the center of all that God wants to do for the world. And that includes you and me. Everything that God makes available to us is available 
in is found in Christ. He is the treasure that we'd sell everything for. He is the pursuit that is worth dying for. Let's not make the same mistake the Galatians were making, seeking to earn his blessing. Let's look to Jesus. Only God the Father, who gave life to Jesus by raising him from the dead, can give us life through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. What does this life look like? What does it include? Well, let me just give you a few. Forgiveness of sins, which includes freedom from uh, condemnation, guilt, and shame. Healing from our hurt and our brokenness. Freedom from fear, from addictions, from poor, destructive choices. Divine protection, divine provision, and God's favor in many areas of life. His life includes guidelines for parenting, structure to the chaos of our life, cleanup of our relational mess, comfort in distress and suffering, a sense of God's presence, the opportunity to depend upon his power, strength and courage in the face of unbelievably challenging circumstances. It's seeing his hand move on our behalf. God turns the impossible into the possible. These are just the beginning of the blessings that come through the promise that God gave Abraham and eventually to Jesus. They are discovered through Christ by anyone who wishes. So how do we access these blessings of God's rescue plan? Well, number four, they are accessed through faith. If you want to view this as a rule, because that's the best way you know how to make life work, then it's the most important rule of the entire Bible. Faith in Christ is the only way to access God's irrevocable agreement with Christ. Verse 18. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law or keeping a bunch of rules, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Verse 21. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promise? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. And so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian keeping the law, it cannot give life. No amount of rule keeping will ever make us right in our relationship with God. While each law, while each rule, while each ordinance, each command or requirement of God as laid out in scripture has a purpose in God's moral law and how we are to live life and interact with each other, it isn't to give life. And it doesn't give us life. I wish we had time to explore this more. But when we, and when we look to any of them for life, it actually just gives us the opposite, death. Every other religion focuses on perfection to the rules and it leads nowhere but destruction. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that the law in itself cannot change our heart. It can guide us in doing God's will, but it cannot motivate us to want to do God's will. It can show us how to express our desires in a way that honors God, but it cannot give us God-honoring desires. Our heart, our motivation, our desires are only changed when we access the power of God through trusting in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, he gives new life through his spirit, whom he pours into the lives of those who trust him. We live by faith, focused on the promises of God and depending upon his Holy Spirit for strength and for power. I am blown away by the simplicity of what it means to be in Christ. I am in awe of the power available when we choose to come to God through Christ, through this simplicity. And what does it look like for us to walk in his power? Well, Paul, he gives some explicit examples and a very tangible picture of what that looks like in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be studying that come November. So let me ask you, Are you in Christ today? Are you trusting Jesus' suffering and death to pay for your sin? As we've looked at some blessings available through Jesus, do you feel like you're missing out? And do you find yourself looking to rules to give you the abundant life that Jesus came to live? to give. You know, on the back of the sermon notes, if you could just pull them out, it describes here how we can access God's promise. And if, if this is you today, I'd just love to walk through these real briefly and then give you an opportunity to respond. You can see there, number one, we need to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the only way to God and that we need them in our life. Second thing is we need to be willing to turn from the things that God would not approve of. That's called sin, as he's outlined in the scripture. And instead, we decide to live according to his word, to honor Jesus Christ by how we live our life. The big word for that is repentance. When then we believe that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross and that he rose from the grave and we can accept his payment of our sin on our behalf. And then lastly, we can simply pray. We can pray inviting Jesus Christ to come into our life. We surrender our life, our leader, the leadership over to him. And then we can expect to receive the Holy Spirit that we've been talking about and this life transformation that's available. So if this is you, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond right now. In fact, I'm going to be reading through this prayer. If this is you and you're ready to make this decision, you can do that right now. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and that I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and I trust in you alone for my salvation. I choose to turn away from the things in my life of which you don't approve and now surrender my life to you. I invite you to come and reign and rule in my heart and life and I open my spirit to you. Establish your presence within me and please bring me your peace. I want to know the power of the Holy Spirit working in me and live forever with you in the kingdom of God. I choose to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. 
amen. You know, if that is you, you made that decision right now, I'd encourage you to tell somebody before you leave. Maybe tell the person you came with. If you're online joining us, maybe tell, it, tell somebody that you're with or text someone immediately this decision that you've made. You know, there's a light bulb behind me. It represents someone who last week, right at the end of our service, submitted their life to Jesus Christ. Praise God. Let's stand 